Christian Römer von der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung hat am Anfang schon die Protagonisten des Abends ein wenig vorgestellt und auch schon gesagt, dass wir gleich nochmal einen Vortrag, einen etwas vertiefenderen Vortrag zum Thema hören werden und danach ins Gespräch einsteigen werden. Mein Name ist Shelly Kupferberg. Ich freue mich jetzt sehr, unseren Gast aus Kanada zu mir zu bitten. I'd like to welcome Sarah T. Roberts with her lecture coming from Canada all the way, jet-lagged but happy. Thanks for coming, Sarah, first of all. Ich finde, das hat doch einen Applaus verdient. Gestern erst angereist und jetzt geht's schon in die Vollen. Reconfigurations of digital labor, commercial content moderation. Darüber wird sie jetzt den Vortrag halten und Sie merken schon, wir werden jetzt um, into English switchen sozusagen. Das wäre eher Dinglisch, aber yeah. well, we are going to switch into English yeah. right now. Afterwards we are going to talk to each other to raise some questions about this context and I would be happy actually to talk with you as well. Maybe you ha you'll have some questions or remarks on the topic, so yeah, feel welcomed. Okay, but now, Thank Sarah, you. it's your turn. Thanks. Uh, I like to take a picture of the audience for my social media accounts. Uh, I'm not even kidding. Yeah, hopefully, that's right. Keep all of your nipples in, please, for that photo. Uh, well, good evening. Um, thank you for your interest in this topic. Thank you to the uh, Böhle Institute for this uh, I invitation. Uh, th thank you to Moritz for that uh, compelling intervention. Um, I, I feel like I understand German, having seen it three times now, I really get it. Um, I apologize that I'll be speaking to you in English this evening. Uh, as a third generation German-American, I know zero German, uh, which is how they like to do it in the US, uh, where I come from. Uh, so this evening, I, I'd like to share with you um, some, some definitional framing for the topic of commercial content moderation. Uh, which hopefully will undergird and, and uh, uh, flesh out some of the material that you've already seen and been exposed to uh, this evening. Uh, I've been working on this topic for six years, beginning as a, as a doctoral student in, in Illinois in the United States, uh, where I read a, a brief article, almost a throwaway piece, as it were, in the New York Times on a bunch of workers who had previously been uh, family farmers in the state of Iowa, next door to Illinois and next door to the state I come from of Wisconsin, people who probably look very much like me uh, from, a, from a family background very much like my own, who uh, had moved from the family farms, uh, which had turned into major agribusiness concerns and uh, which they no longer owned, and were working in a call center environment doing screening of social media material. Uh, the tagline of the company for which they worked was outsourced to Iowa, not India. When you see something like that as a doctoral student, you know you've hit the gold mine, so to speak. Uh, I, I attempted to reach out to, uh, to this company, but after their profile in the New York Times that was less than flattering, I got nowhere. And so I took my search to find workers who were doing uh, what, what I later termed commercial content moderation uh, anywhere I could, and I ended up uh, talking to workers who were working in Silicon Valley, first of all, and then I also spoke with workers in Canada, and then later in the Philippines. Uh, I'll be sharing some of the results of, of those, uh, those interviews and uh, interrogations with you this evening. Um, so this has been my focus for the last six years, uh, which has allowed me to think a great deal about uh, the practices that make up commercial content moderation and some of their uh, significant implications for uh, things like the nature of the internet as we now uh, experience it, uh, for things like the future of work. Uh, this is especially important in the context of the way economic and, and other types of policy are being developed around so-called knowledge labor and so on. And, and so all of those things will make up a bit of my talk this evening. Uh, I think first of all, it'd be helpful to, uh, to put a framework around this, this concept of commercial content moderation. So I will describe it to you as, as a globalized, around-the-clock set of practices in which workers view and adjudicate massive amounts of user-generated content known as UGC in industry lingo 
destined for the world's social media platforms and interactive websites. While the worker's status and remuneration vary widely depending on where they are in the world and their circumstance, CCM, as I call it, is typically unglamorous, repetitive, and often exposes workers to content that is disturbing, violent, and even psychologically damaging all as a condition of their work. CCM workers render content visible while simultaneously remaining invisible. In the world of CCM, the sign of a good job is to leave no sign at all. And yet the mediation work done by CCM workers goes directly to shaping the landscape of the social media UGC dominated internet where platforms ex exist as otherwise empty vessels for users to fill up with whatever they will and for CCM workers to act as gatekeeper between user and platform, providing primarily the brand protection that platform owners demand. Companies do not talk about their moderation practices, treating it as a trade secret and subjecting workers to non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs, that preclude them from speaking about the nature and conditions of their work. Yet despite its hidden nature, CCM is an essential component to the production and circulation of social media. Making decisions about what UGC is acceptable and what is not is a complex process well beyond the capabilities of software or algorithms alone. YouTube, for one example, receives over 100 hours of up uploaded video per minute. While some content lends itself to partial batch processing or other types of uh, machine automation, the vast majority of it requires human intervention, particularly when it involves video content or images. When UGC is screened, either before or after it has been posted, human content moderators are called upon to employ an array of high-level cognitive functions and cultural competencies to make decisions about its appropriateness for a site or platform. They must be experts in the matters of taste of the site's presumed audience, have cultural knowledge about location of origin of the platform and of the audience, both of which may be far removed geographically and culturally from where the screening is taking place, have linguistic competency in the language of the UGC that may be a learned or second language for the content moderator, be steeped in the relevant laws governing the site's location of origin and be experts in the user guidelines and other platform level specifics concerning what is and is not allowed all the while being exposed constantly to the very material that mainstream sites disallow. To just give you an idea of what uh, that constitutes, you can take a look at this uh, screenshot from YouTube, uh, which uh, lets you know what uh, the screeners are screening out or screening for in order to remove. So sex and nudity, hate speech, shocking and disgusting material, dangerous illegal acts, uh, violence against children, sexual violence against children, abuse, etc. Uh, all, all sorts of things that they see uh, and are inundated with constantly throughout the course of their workday. Uh, I want to make the point here that CCM in and of itself is not an industry. In fact, it's, it's a set of labor processes that are, are located across a number of different industry settings. Uh, this chart gives you a, a sense of where those sites are. Uh, some workers are located in-house, and by this I mean they're working on-site at some of the largest uh, internet firms that, that one can think of. They're working at the headquarters of these companies. Uh, these are companies that have both the finances and the infrastructure to support that kind of work taking place on site. Although I should note that uh, th these workers are typically contract workers even when they're working at say Google or Facebook headquarters. So they retain a differential and, and frankly lower status than other workers even while working uh, physically in the same place. There are uh, boutique firms that are similar to ad agencies or other kinds of um, social media one-stop shops that not only will do content moderation for clients, but also will even create or seed more favorable content into the social media streams. Uh, there are call centers. We heard about the call center environment already in the previous intervention. I'll talk more about that. Large-scale physical operations centers that handle this kind of work on a 24 by 7 basis uh, prior to the rise of CCM, many of these centers focus primarily on taking or making live phone calls, but they have the infrastructure where they can support CCM work. And then finally, we have micro labor websites, sites such as Mechanical Turk from Amazon and other sorts of sites where uh, workers around the world uh, engage in what, what is known as digital piecework. They come together with a particular piece of content, make a decision about it, and the company that asked for it and the, the person that adjudicated it part ways never to uh, perhaps meet again. I've seen uh, this type of work go for as little as one penny per, uh, per view. 
Uh, I'll turn now to talk about uh, my first, uh, the first portion of my study where I, I spoke with workers in Silicon Valley at a firm I call Megatech. Megatech is obviously not the real name of the firm. Um, I will leave it to your imaginations to uh, decide which one it is, but I can tell you that it's a firm that all of us in this room uh, uh, are familiar with and whose products we all, we all are engaged with on a regular basis. Uh, the workers that I spoke with at Megatech were, were all young people in their early 20s. They were required to be university graduates. They had four-year university degrees, and they came from elite institutions, in, in, interestingly enough, in, in the United States, uh, places like the University of California at Berkeley or the University of Southern California. Uh, they also graduated, I might add, thanks to our, our particularly American system of higher education with significant student loan debt. I have it, too. Um, so they came to Megatech uh, with backgrounds uh, from these elite schools, but with degrees in the humanities and degrees in the social sciences and not in the sort of prized so-called STEM area, which would have allowed them to take on engineering jobs and other sorts of higher order positions at Megatech. Uh, instead, the jobs that they cr could secure were uh, the CCM jobs. And uh, despite the uh, potential downside for the, the workers that I spoke to, the, uh, the promise and the chance of securing work in the new media economy of Northern California's tech industry was alluring and, uh, and, and loaded with promise indeed for them. Uh, to even uh, have obtained full-time post-graduation employment was seen as uh, quite a positive in the post-2008 uh, crash economy of the United States. Um, the CCM job to them seemed like it might be a way up and a way into a longer term career with a better status and pay at, at Megatech. But in fact, uh, this wasn't the case for anyone. And the workers who did this work at Megatech were limited, term limited, to two years maximum doing this work. We can imagine why that might be. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, they were able to do uh, one year with a three-month break, uh, during which I guess they were supposed to go find some other work or do something with themselves. After that break, they could come back for another year. After the second year, they had to find new employment. So that was the, the CCM opportunity at Megatech. And of course, they came through as contract workers. Nevertheless, for these, uh, for these young people, uh, this type of work seemed better than what they uh, felt was their other option, jobs in the service-based economy of food service, restaurant work, baristas, and so on. Uh, that having been said, uh, the work that they did at Megatech, even though they were somewhat forewarned about its nature, was surprising for, for many of them. And it gave them pause and, and, a, and a mechanism uh, from which to uh, reflect on, uh, on the nature of the social media industry and its implications for, for all of us as users, uh, much more so than, than the average person might have opportunity to do. Uh, one of the workers I spoke to was uh, Max Breen, who was 24. He was, the, he was a grad of a, a private liberal arts college in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Max, for his, for his time at Megatech, made about 48,000 US dollars a year, living in San Francisco, which is one of the most expensive places around in the world. I incidentally, most of them lived with many roommates, as you can imagine. Um, he was servicing his student loan debt while working at Megatech. And uh, Max was a particularly keen observer of, of the kind of work he was doing. Certainly, he indicated to me that, uh, that he had trouble leaving the work behind at Megatech. And it, it went with him uh, after he left work. He, uh, he found himself dwelling on, on what he saw despite uh, the training of the very brief training that suggested that they should just try to essentially forget about it. Um, Max also had a lot of insight into the way in which his work at Megatech shaped uh, the, the general social media landscape for users in a, in a way that was often hidden and without any recourse for users to really understand the process. For example, uh, he talked about some of the worst content that he saw that would disturb him after he was at work, and that material was coming from the war zone of Syria. It was often involving uh, very much unedited raw footage, uh, usually of children being killed in bombings and other kinds of attacks in Syria. And although if you think back to the screen that I showed you that indicated that such material harmed children, uh, 
particularly disgusting or graphic, violent material would be disallowed by a platform such as YouTube or other mainstream platforms. In, in the case of Megatech, Max found that uh, a decision came down from the policy group higher than uh, his rank as a CCM worker to allow that material to stand. It seemed to be coming uh, from the perspective of advocacy. So people from Syria were sending this footage in, wanting to share it with the world for advocacy purposes. But Max pointed out to me the, the inconsistency with these policies. Uh, at the same time that the Syrian footage was being allowed, material was flowing in from the Juarez uh, Northern Mexico drug wars, another place where the U.S. has significant interest in what's going on there, and another another uh, source of, of advocacy for people who were living with the violence of, of that situation. And when this material came in, it was disallowed out of hand. So Max quickly made the connection to me in speaking with me that uh, he felt that often these decisions about what might be allowed or disallowed interestingly and, and, and rather oddly seem to al align with U.S. foreign policy interests. And, uh, uh, you know, this is somebody making a, a very low wage at a very low level, and he, he was able to see himself in, in a much larger picture about what was uh, being curated, essentially, for the general public, not only in the U.S., but worldwide through the platforms that Megatech offered. Uh, it was a, a rather profound observation. Another worker I spoke to, Josh Santos, a, a Berkeley grad, again, with uh, many tens of thousands of dollars of debt, shared with me that his experience at Megatech was akin to uh, submersing himself into a hole of filth every day uh, at work. And um, again, he was another worker who talked about the way in which uh, this, this material would be carried home with him outside of, outside of uh, his work life. So uh, he would think about these incidents of child sexual abuse, violence uh, towards animals and other people, hate speech. Um, uh, other kinds of hate symbolism, the war zone footage that, re that they received and so on, uh, in the context of social situations. Uh, he found that uh, although uh, a normal sort of re human reaction might be to want to share this with friends and talk about it, he would hold back out of a sense of altruism that he didn't want to burden others with what he saw at work. Uh, likewise, he, he had a sense of altruism about the work he was doing for Megatech and for uh, and on all of our behalfs, saying that um, it, without the workers at Megatech and workers doing CCM on other platforms, the internet would essentially be unusable and, and unwatchable. And he was willing to take on the work because he could, uh, quote unquote, take it. Uh, at the same time, people like Max and Josh reported to me um, right alongside their ability to stand such material, that they were having trouble in intimate relationships with partners. Uh, they would try to get close to a, a girlfriend or a partner in a, an intimate or a sexual uh, moment and suddenly have a flash of a video or an image they'd seen at work come before their eyes or come into their memory, and uh, the moment would stop and they would find it difficult to share this with partners. Uh, they also spoke about uh, their increase in drinking alcohol. Uh, drinking alcohol outside of work, uh, obviously a coping mechanism. Uh, and, you know, even if Max and Josh decided to confide in, in, in friends or, or other kinds of colleagues who did not do CCM work, they were under the uh, auspices of a non-disclosure agreement, which meant that such sharing would put them in jeopardy of losing their job, and those disclosures are taken very seriously, which is uh, in large part uh, why this, these, uh, these workers are, are uh, presented to you today under pseudonyms and why their work site is presented that way. Uh, so. This is just a glimpse into uh, the, the glamorous reality of, of, the, uh, of the new uh, forms of work that uh, have come up uh, alongside the rise of the digital technology, technology sec sector really over the past 20 years, I would say, since, um, since the rise of, of the graphical internet and the commercial internet. Um, certainly, uh, these forms of work are occurring against a backdrop of uh, all kinds of uh, media, economic policy, and, and educational policy that uh, puts primacy on securing jobs in, in this new economy. Uh, but in fact, I think stories like Max and, and Josh's put lie to the fantasy that there is a great deal of deliverance for workers in this sector. Uh, in other words, is this the knowledge society that we were promised? Um, uh, where, where are our flying cars and where are our leisure jobs, right? 
Uh, so uh, certainly over the past 40 odd years in the American context, we've been, uh, we've been told that uh, we could expect a post-industrial society, one that would uh, move away from manufacturing jobs of the 20th century, move away from agricultural jobs, uh, and move into um, service sector work that would rely heavily on digitization on the one hand of society and on um, knowledge and uh, and other kinds of uh, technical work, on the other hand, data analysis, engineering, and so on. Um, and that these shifts would, would result in a, a better uh, circumstance of work for most people. Uh, certainly, we've seen uh, the elimination of the manufacturing sector, by and large, in the United States. But uh, I'm not sure it has actually led to this. Uh, which is what we expected, uh, a great deal more leisure time and a, and a much easier work life. Certainly, uh, the kind of work that the CCM workers do takes them out of the immediate harm's way of physically demanding uh, manufacturing and other kinds of jobs, but it proposes another kind of potential damage to workers, and that's the psychological damage of their exposure long term to this type of content. Um, and certainly, uh, throughout this process of, of the rise of the, uh, the knowledge sector, we've seen a, a broad expansion in the workday itself. I can tell you that my grandfather, a 45-year veteran of the same factory working in the same job for his entire life, never checked an email after 5 p.m. and was never beholden to anything on the weekend. Uh, so we've seen a shift there, too. Rather than more leisure time, there seems to be an encroachment on our, our private lives in the form of work. Other, uh, other features, too, uh, characterize this new knowledge society, uh, one of them being these enormous geospatial, economic, and political reconfigurations that have taken place to facilitate uh, and, and obfuscate, in many cases, the material and Im immaterial labor that underpins the knowledge economy. This often happens via outsourcing and other types of uh, uh, migratory practices with labor. We often see work now being uh, moved to other parts of the world from the West into particularly East Asia, places like the Philippines and elsewhere, China. Uh, often this, this migrates into uh, specific areas called special industrial zones or special economic zones. In the Philippines, the term is ecozone, uh, where terms are favorable for these transnational corporations to base their, their operations or for local co uh, corporations working on contract for these international concerns. The countries that host them and the companies that take advantage of them treat these zones as uh, extra, extra state zones or, or almost sovereign in and of their own right, providing all sorts of uh, particular uh, favorable conditions for locating there, such as tax holidays, uh, uh, environmental uh, laxity, labor, uh, labor pools that lack organization, uh, cheap labor, and, and so on. And all of this is quite alluring to these companies who are eager to relocate to these sites. This is, of course, the case in the Philippines, uh, where an entire government uh, ministry exists called the Philippines Economic Zone Authority, or PESA, to manage all of the many sites that have developed to cater to these, uh, these outsourcing practices. And I should tell you that the Philippines, at just one-tenth the population size of India, which is often thought of in our imaginations as the call center uh, center of the world, it in fact surpasses India at this time and, and uh, serves as the call center for the world and of the world uh, at just a, a fraction of its size. Um, this is, in fact, a, a couple screenshots from microsourcing, just one of the many companies located in the Philippines as well as in the United States that solicits Western companies to come locate there, taking advantage, as you can see, of the excellent language skills, Western slang, great eye for detail, and so on that they uh, explain Filipino people possess. All of this has led to some very significant and unusual development as well, and we end up seeing things uh, in, in Manila, for example, where some places such as Eastwood City look like this, and others look just like this. Uh, by the way, this is what I, I call the paperless office. Here it is. So, uh, and, and these, these sites often exist right next door to each other, I mean literally uh, abut each other. Uh, certainly, um, in addition to CCM, there's all kinds of material uh, realities that go into making the internet as we know it, right? The mining of rare earth min minerals, the production of devices, and of course the dismantling of them, which the Philippines is, is well known for. Now I want to say also that I, I don't wish to simply exotify the Philippines as, as some sort of extraordinary site and um, that, that these sorts of things only happen there. In fact, uh, in 
in Silicon Valley itself, uh, East Palo Alto is one of the most impoverished places in the country, and it's right next door to places like Mountain View and the Apple and, and Google headquarters and so on. So this uh, stratification uh, seems to be a characteristic of this new knowledge society that, uh, that we are uh, operating in. Uh, a few words about, about the Filipino case, uh, more specifically to round out a bit of what you already learned. Um, as I said, uh, the Philippines is now the world's uh, center for, for outsourcing activity, what they call business process outsourcing, or BPO, in, in the lingo of that industry. Metro Manila itself is comprised of 17 individual cities, each governed independently, which actually facilitates a lot of, of, these, uh, uh, of these industries uh, locating there. And it has a population of over 12 million people as of 2014, with many millions more coming in and out every day to work, making it one of the most densely populated places on Earth. Um, the area's growth in population and infrastructure development over the past decades are tied directly to its rise as a service sector center for much of the particularly English-speaking uh, West. The development, as I noted, has been uneven as major firms locate important branches there and business operations there, but uh, really develop only for themselves. Uh, in addition, there's the, uh, there's the, the abundant, uh, available, and relatively inexpensive youthful labor force that exists in the Philippines, already intimately familiar with many Western norms, practices, and culture, which I'll talk more about in a moment. So uh, these, these, these uh, environmental factors and these policy factors, as well as some cultural factors that I'll get to in a moment, uh, I'll, I'll go to uh, making this a very attractive site of locating CCM work and other types of call center work. And uh, these companies locate there thanks to these favor favorable governmental policies. So really what we're seeing is a series of, of intertwined systems that, that function to uh, uh, propel and, and, and uh, are propelled by each other in, in essence. These are, there's a certain symbiosis that's going on here among state and governmental policy regimes, uh, land and physical infrastructure development done again by the private sector, but um, under the auspices of so-called public-private partnerships that actually tend to weigh more heavily on one end than the other. I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn. And then of course, uh, the, this, the abundance of, of the uh, labor force that I've already described, as, w as well as uh, a certain uh, formation that they have uh, culturally. Of course, um, I have to acknowledge that, that that particular preparation and formation for the labor force there is against a significant backdrop in the Philippines of a legacy of uh, political and military conquest by Western powers. And then further and more uh, contemporary co colonization uh, and cultural and economic domination in, in the Philippines, uh, primarily by its relationship with the United States. Uh, this is a legacy upon which the, uh, the firms that locate their, their CCM work there absolutely uh, draw, both for the competencies of, of their workers as well as these favorable conditions. And in my research, I came across this uh, 1923 map um, entitled uh, Trade Routes of the Orient, so to speak. And you can see that its emphasis is on the Philippines. And you won't be shocked to learn that many of those flows of, at one time, material goods and, and shipping actually very much mirror the flows in and out of data and other kinds of um, economic capital in and out of the Philippines. And you can see there's a nice link right there to, to San Francisco on that map. So uh, last May, I visited the Philippines, and I was able to speak with a number of workers there. And uh, I, I'm just going to highlight a few of the themes that, that came out of those uh, interventions with those workers, all of whom shared a great deal in common with their Silicon Valley counterparts, as a matter of fact. Young people, uh, university graduates, probably less debt than their American counterparts, but um, a different, uh, different cultural context. Uh, but uh, relative to other jobs that were available, making good money, in this, in this CCM career, uh, but also dealing with the ramifications of being exposed to uh, the kind of content that they were day in and day out, often looking at, as we heard in the uh, previous intervention, thousands upon thousands of pieces of this content a day. Uh, the workers, uh, that having been said, uh, they, had a, they had an ambiguous relationship to the work that they did. Um, 
you know, there's a certain ease, there's a certain prestige to being involved in BPO work in, in contemporary Manila as a young person. Uh, there's certainly an economic benefit that you earn quite a bit of money, which you can then take into the, uh, the uh, malls with all the represent representatives of, uh, of uh, global um, uh, clothing shops, the Starbucks, and so on, all of which I see on Friedrichstrasse here, by the way. So uh, I'm not sure that's specific to the Philippines either. Uh, the, the workers who had trained often for other types of careers, much like their US counterparts, found themselves doing a job that they necess wouldn't necessarily have imagined uh, themselves doing. Uh, but this is what was available and on offer to them. And certainly in the Philippines, where everyone is working in a BPO, uh, it's, it's almost difficult to want to make another choice. And it's really not a financially sound thing to do at this point. Um, but at the same time, the workers were available of the extreme precarity of their work. And in fact, um, on one team, they had gone from hundreds of uh, people working on a CCM contract for a dating app, uh, which uh, suddenly uh, was able to be relocated to India at a cheaper rate. And uh, the, the team was uh, cut down to a quarter of its initial size. And this kind of uh, jumping of, and movement of contracts among countries and to different sites happens all the time. So the workers have virtually no stability in their job life, even if they are able to uh, stomach the work after a couple of years. Um, the work certainly won't, won't be there as it uh, migrates around the globe. Finally, I think I'll leave you with just a few thoughts before we move into the next portion of, of the evening. But uh, th this is a non-exhaustive list. This is just meant to, uh, to get us thinking about some of the things that are at stake uh, for CCM work. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned, it's a central and mission critical activity in the workflow of online media production, yet it is little known, often hidden, hidden by design, hidden by the companies themselves that need it and solicit it, uh, applying NDAs and other type, types of uh, uh, mechanisms to, uh, to obfuscate the need for this work. And of course, it's frequently low wage and low status wherever it is in the world. It reflects and relies upon problematic uh, labor forms, labor forms that are uh, outsourced, globalized, precarious, uh, low paying, um, low status, uh, lacking uh, safety, lacking organization, and la lacking worker protection. Certainly, it troubles the notion of the internet as a free speech zone and as a site of democratic intervention. And I say this. Um, to, to let you know that the CCM workers themselves are some of the most savvy individuals that you will meet in terms of talking about what the actual state of the internet uh, offers, offers the populace. Many of them will say things to me like, um, what would ever make you think the internet is a free speech zone? It's owned by private companies with their platforms. Why would they provide free speech over a profit motive, for example? Uh, they're certainly aware of that. Uh, at the very least, it uh, reveals the existence of people intervening between user to platform to world, which is often the way that internet uh, sites are presented to users as a lure to get them to engage. We certainly know now that CCM workers exist within these, uh, these liminal stages and states. Uh, we know that other agents uh, are, are in there too, the NSA for one, right? Certainly in the German context, we're well aware of that. Uh, who else is, is within the digital media production uh, uh, cycle? I think that bears uh, a, a discussion and, and a conversation. And finally, content moderation puts uh, workers in difficult and even dangerous working conditions where they are often, uh, even when psychological counseling is offered by their workplace, um, there's such a stigma to accessing it that they are unable to do so. In other words, when, uh, when the sign of doing a good job at CCM is your ability to stomach the work, what does it mean when you have to access psychological services? Uh, most of them avoid it. Most of them don't want to talk about the work that they do uh, more than they have to, which means not wanting to talk about it with a counselor. So they're left to their own devices. After two years at Megatech, they cycle out, they take another job, uh, and uh, the company that employed them, their contracting agency, and the firm that needed their services in the first place, Megatech, uh, take no responsibility for their well-being beyond, uh, beyond their, their time in employment. What does that mean for a whole class of workers, a whole class of young people who either burn out from the work because they can no longer stomach it, or perhaps even worse yet, become desensitized and inured to the kind of violence that most of us would not even be able to bear for a few seconds. Um, so what we're left with is, a, is an ambiguous future for CCM workers. Uh, the man on the right, incidentally, is, uh, is, a, is a man in the Philippines who 
uh, runs a popular podcast entitled The Call Center Show. There's a whole kind of cultural uh, uh, lifestyle built up around BPO and call center work, and he's one of the people who supports it with his uh, creative and artistic endeavors. The hashtag on his T-shirt uh, in, in Tagalog uh, reads or translates into English into something like insomnia heroes or nocturnal heroes because the workers who do CCM work and other kinds of call center work in the Philippines often work of uh, the night shift. They, they come on online when workers in the West go offline, and they do their work uh, on the opposite schedule, meaning that I met them for happy hour at 7 a.m. at Eastwood City when most of them were, were smoking cigarettes and drinking beers, having come off shift. I'll, I'll close with this image, which is uh, a, an image uh, in some regards of how the Filipino call center industry views itself. This is a piece of corporate art that you can find in Eastwood City in uh, one of these eco zones and cyber parks. I took a lot of pictures of this piece of, of art, this sculpture, and a lot of Filipino people were walking past me wanting to intervene and tell me, you know, that's not actually Filipino art. We have a whole museum you can go visit. Why are you taking a picture of this throwaway corporate art? But in fact, I found it quite compelling. If you can see the detail there, you'll see there are three workers, all of whom have uh, headsets on, headsets not dissimilar to the one I'm wearing, actually. And those are the, the headsets that you wear when you're a call center worker answering calls. Uh, the plaque on the sculpture reads, uh, the sculpture is dedicated to the men and women that have found purpose and passion in the business process outsourcing industry. Their commitment to service is the lifeblood of Eastwood City, the birthplace of BPO in the Philippines. Uh, the Eastwood City was declared under presidential, presidential proclamation number 191 as the Philippines' first special economic zone dedicated to information technology, Eastwood City's modern heroes. And I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And you can just stay on stage because we're going to talk now. We just have to... Uh, fix the stage a bit. Wir werden hier einen kleinen Umbau noch erleben auf der Bühne und dann wollen wir uns ins Gespräch begeben. Wir werden schon mal hier ein bisschen die Stühle rücken und dann geht es gleich weiter. Und wie gesagt, Sie sind herzlich eingeladen, mit uns mit Fragen zu stellen. Wir werden natürlich so ein bisschen zurückspulen noch mal in der Diskussion. Sarah hat uns schon einen sehr tiefen Einblick in die Komplexität des Themas gegeben, aber wir wollen noch mal so ein paar Basisinformationen abklopfen, bevor wir uns dann ja über Details unterhalten. Ich darf Ihnen äh, noch eine Teilnehmerin vorstellen. Sie wurde vorhin schon ganz kurz von Christian Römer angedeutet. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass Geraldine de Bastion heute bei uns ist, Vorsitzende der Digitalen Gesellschaft e.V. Herzlich willkommen, Geraldine. Und auch Moritz Riesewig bitte ich noch einmal zu uns, dass er uns so ein bisschen von seinen Erfahrungen vor Ort in Manila berichtet. Moritz, noch einmal vielen Dank für deine Performance Lecture. Well, I would like to start with Moritz. Moritz, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience you made in Manila while you were researching um, about content moderators? For example, how are those people hired? How do they find their jobs? Is it, has it been an official market? And do they know from beginning on what their work is about? Uh, first of all, I have to say, um, The work I did, I showed today, and it's an ongoing work because there were several uh, projects coming out of it. Um, actually, the result of a research I did with Tina Ebert. Um, she's part of uh, our group La Ocon. And the research uh, in Manila I did uh, with Hans Block and Omid Mianur. Um, and a lot of other people in the background of this project um, helping to research this because it's actually not easy to to get results, as you can obviously uh, confirm, um, because it's a complete hidden world, as we already got to know, um, and people are really afraid of their, um, of their bosses uh, in the companies. Um, and yeah, to answer this question, 
Um, no, they don't know. In, in a lot of cases, they don't know at all about uh, what, they, uh, what they are taking as a job um, in the moment they, they are hired. Because as we already um, got to know, all these um, titles for this work, no? fallout management, I, know, <laughs> I mean, um, who Could knows what that is? No. Nobody knows. And so in the moment they are hired, they don't have any clue about what um, there will be. I mean, and then there is uh, this psychological testing I mentioned in the performance, uh, which a lot of companies use. And this is maybe even a bit more um, problematic because um, what they do is they ask the, the employees before they are hired, um, do you have problems with uh, seeing these or this kind of images? No? Um, or um, can you cope with stress? And in the moment you want to be hired by a company, and I mean, compared to other jobs in the Philippines, this is really a more or less well-paid job, um, they won't tell the, this company, oh, I'm, I'm, I actually, I can't cope with stress at all. I'm really bad in seeing um, uh, violence and um, um, pornography is a real problem for me. <laughs> Who will do this? So um, in the end, um, when they are hired and when they have to cope with this um, 10 hours per day, um, they will never um, be able to say, um, oh, I didn't know about this because the bosses will always be, pos be able to say, but you confirmed in the beginning that you are okay with this kind of material. So <laughs> actually the responsibility is given back to the workers and this is uh, a real problem. And second is that the psychological support they might get in the companies is actually a big fake. You know? Because, um, I mean, asking the psychologi psychologist um, what kind of support she could offer, she told us, um, yeah, I, I, I always tell them they need to, um, they, need, they need distance to their work. I mean, in a moment, uh, there is an image in your mind um, um, not letting you go and um, yeah, following you into the bed. I don't know if you say this in English. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's, it's possible to uh, get distance in this moment by just saying, yeah, I need to distinguish between work and leisure time. I need a hobby, maybe. Sarah. You met some of the content moderators in the US, as we heard. Has there been any differences between them and the one who work at the Philippines, for example? The circumstances, are they different? Well, uh, is this on? Check. <laughs> this on? Okay, there we go. Uh, you know, actually, I went to the Philippines expecting, well, thinking that uh, there would be some sort of really significant difference between uh, the North American workers and the workers in the Philippines. But in fact, what I found w were a lot of similarities, uh, as I pointed out in the talk. So um, the expectation of um, uh, finding work after a university degree, the sense that um, it was a good thing to get into uh, the technology sector, um, at, at any cost, uh, although the work was, uh, you know, it's, it's marginally in the technology sector. I mean, what does that even mean in this case? Um, aspirations beyond doing commercial content moderation, they all shared that. So in fact, um, you know, these were young people who were in a similar place in their life uh, and with similar aspirations who were doing work um, that they probably had never imagined and that I don't think anyone would aspire to. And in that regard, uh, they were quite similar to their, their peers in the Bay Area. The, the difference that I would note is that um, while the Filipino workers gave a lot of uh, mental energy and, and other kinds of uh, effort over to thinking about um, their counterparts in the West, I don't necessarily think that that uh, went the other way. Um, and, and so the Filipino workers, even to other workers in North America doing similar jobs, are, are invisible in a sense. 
Uh, they're aware that they exist sometimes. They know that somebody does this work uh, at night, or, or they know that they're out there, but they don't really feel a, a great connection with them. On the other hand, the Filipino workers, all of whom were working for some intermediary corporation of some sort, whether it was Task Us that we saw from Moritz or uh, Microsourcing, the firm that I showed in, in my slide, or one of hundreds, literally hundreds of firms, uh, they were all working for these contracting agencies, but there was this practice there of encouraging the workers to um, develop an aff effective relationship with the, f the firm for whom they were ultimately doing the moderation. And um, that is absolutely a one-way street. I can guarantee you that um, those, those social media firms don't feel the same um, uh, responsibility towards the, those Filipino workers that they were um, encouraged to develop in the other direction. And, and so from that perspective, uh, that seemed to be a particular cultural nuance that existed among the Filipino workers. And I would say that that, that is somewhat to their detriment. Uh, so a Filipino worker might identify him or herself as being an employee of, say, IBM, but there's absolutely no uh, indication from IBM's standpoint that that worker is employed by them. And, and uh, I think that has real consequences materially and, and uh, emotionally and psychologically. So that was, that was odd, yeah. Well, I would like to discuss the point that uh, we're talking about curating the internet, which is another word for censorship, actually, in this content, where context we're talking about. So how should we discuss that issue, Geraldine? Big question to start with, I Shelley. know, I'm sorry. Um, I think we should break that question down to start with. Um, much of what we've seen and have heard here tonight is extremely shocking and asks, like, poses a number of questions about how we deal with this content, but also about the societies that we live in and people who produce this content. All of, this, all of these atrocities that you reported of, that these people have to see are are crimes or are abuses or acts of violence that happen in real life that then get posted on the net. And I think at the core, that is the issue we need to address. Um, I don't want to pinpoint any of the examples. I even feel like it sickens me just to repeat them verbally. But the point in your presentation was where you said, I mean, we all know about the extremist violence of ISIS and the way they're spreading that violence um, as part of their a political approach, but to put a picture of um, a beheading as a dating profile picture, I mean, that maybe pinpoints as an example the um, horrors of society that are also part of the discussion that we're having around here. Um, I think that's one of the aspects that we should be looking at and dealing with. Um, and then, of course, all of this poses a lot of questions on um, how, how does one regulate this. But I think uh, one major point that we should be discussing is um, the, the emphasis on social media platforms, commercial social media platforms, as Facebook, as a place where we spend a lot of our time, as a place where we, um, we basically document our individual lives and therefore give a lot of power to these platforms and the logic with which these platforms operate as to how far are we as a society um, abiding to these rules and regulations that, as we've heard tonight, are made by a handful of people sitting in one place of the world who probably have a very homogenic background. And that is probably not the diverse background represented that the world has on, in total. Um, I think that is one issue we should be discussing. And another issue we should be discussing is um, these people that we've heard of tonight have the horrible job of deleting this content. At what point is there any system where any um, criminal justice process takes place? And I think this is a major issue. We're talking about the privatization of criminal justice um, to large extents with um, people being individually burdened with the decision if this is something they should delete or not, rather than being individually burdened with the decision whether this is something that they pass on to police authorities or not. Yes, and uh, brings me to the question, Moritz, do you want to add something? Yeah, maybe. I think it's switched on. You just is switched it? Yeah. close to <laughs> um, Yeah, maybe in terms of this um, private uh, 
private substitution of police. I think there is a video online by uh, Bryce, um, the guy we saw, the, the founder of Taskers, saying that he is proud that he uh, and his company um, do a lot of work and help the police by doing um, their work. Um, and that they are even an, an, un, um, an, an absolutely necessary part um, of, a, of the, the work World which needs to be done by, by the state, by the government, <laughs> or by, by, by um, whomever. Um, so this is really a stunning, um, a stunning text, <laughs> um, so to say, um, he published, because it shows um, that what happens there is that there is actually a, not only an outsourcing of work from the US or from um, Europe to um, to the Philippines and other countries, but there's also an outsourcing of really like um, crucial um, crucial responsibility of a state um, outsourced to private firms. And I think this is really alarming, isn't it? Just to add a, a vignette to that, um, uh, again, going back to the words of the moderators themselves, Max Breen relayed to me uh, the story of how he and his colleagues would uh, periodically, uh, probably more often than periodically, frequently come across videos in which a person expressed suicidal ideation, uh, intent to kill themselves or harm themselves. And in these cases, uh, when, whenever it was possible, the CCM employees would uh, work with, uh, try to figure out where the person was in the, in the world and then try to work with the, the local law enforcement and other kinds of uh, agents in that area to get to the individual and, uh, and help them. And Max said, you know, when, when that took place and when they were able to make an intervention uh, upon someone who was threatening or, or even perhaps in, in the process of committing suicide, uh, uh, they often felt really good around the office, kind of high-fiving each other and, and congratulating each other. And he said to me, you know, what if, what if it's the stuff that people see on our platform that drives them to feel this way? You know, I mean, what can I say? It's, it's, it's a, as, as another person I interviewed, an executive with a, a digital media firm, told me, when you open up a hole on the internet, it gets filled with shit. And, uh, and so these workers were certainly uh, swimming in it, and they were aware that uh, other people were seeing it. That's, in fact, how that material would get flagged. And so there were implications not only for the workers, but also for, for the general public for seeing the very material that, that you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you, as we heard, those jobs are temporary. So what happens afterwards? Do they... Uh, or are they allowed to uh, tell about their experience? Do they have to sign not to talk about it? They do. They do have to sign that. They are, these uh, papers are called non-disclosure agreements. Um, everybody has to sign who wants to work in this industry. And uh, they take it really serious. Um, and we talked to this, um, um, this foundation, Bien, um, and they tried to defend the workers' rights, but it's it's more or less uh, impossible because um, they suffer from a lot of uh, repression from the companies. They told us that that some of the um, content moderators were called by numbers they didn't know um, after having joined this uh, foundation uh, they found it. Um, some others were followed home by um, unknown persons um, after having um, joined this uh, foundation. So there's um, actually a huge pressure on these workers not to tell anybody about what they see and uh, whom they work for. So um, it's, not, um, it's not only talking to the press, uh, which is impossible for them, but it's also um, it's not even t uh, possible to talk to their families, it's not even possible to talk to other departments of the same company, not even that. Um, because, and that's the, the reason why, um, for example, freelance platforms like uh, Elance or Upwork, I don't know if um, some people know them, um, why, why these platforms are not really appropriate for um, this kind of work, because uh, what happens there is that the freelancers are independent and this uh, makes it impossible for companies like Facebook and co um, to give pressure on these workers. You know? And um, so it's necessary to source it out mainly to companies who can control their workers. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and the way they control is um, the same way we um, we notice uh, from um, modern companies like Google um, or others or, or companies here. It's not only repression, it's also this um, image of we are a family, what we <laughs> heard about. No? But why, Geraldine, is, has there been such a lot amount of intransparency of Facebook or other social network providers and, and companies? Why don't they talk about those issues? It's a question of power, isn't it? Well, yes, I would like to add something to that yeah. point in a second, but to answer your question first, um, I think intransparency is a huge part of this problem. Um, this sort of air and this myth of these ungraspable companies where you have like one shining light of a leading figure at the top and then you know nothing else that happens beneath that, right? And these shining light figures that sit at the top then get treated like um, like heads of state when they travel and also sort of secede the role of a normal CEO of a company to that of a, of a state representative, basically, um, which I think is very um, exemplary of, of a lot of the issues that we're talking about here. But um, I think in transparency, is, like I said, is a big, big issue and a big problem and it's it takes place on many levels in transparency as to how the rules are made um, in transparency and how these companies actually work and function numbers how many people are employed where doing this kind of work um, but also in transparency uh, when it comes to a number of other things like I'm I mean we we're just talking about this earlier also I've like I think Google has changed a bit over the last couple of years, but five, six years ago, it was impossible to actually reach somebody in an office at that company the way you would in any other normal industry and be like, hey, you know, so where's your office and how many people work there? And I think the same is true still for the sort of, um, yeah, un untouchableness of a number of these platforms. Um, I ran a project at the um, Stiftung Neue Verantwortung last year where uh, we did a lot of work on, on this and similar topics. And uh, because we posted about it online, uh, we out of the blue got an email from a Facebook representative saying that she was traveling through Germany and she would love to come and visit us and talk to us in a behind the scenes um, meeting and would bring along a few of her German colleagues. And after this behind the scenes meeting, the German colleagues were like, well, we're here now, we have an office now, you can call us now, you can talk to us now. And um, guess what happened when we tried that? The next time, nothing. So um, it's still very difficult to get a public discourse going with representatives from these companies. It's also difficult to get a discourse going that's not public but meaningful. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, of course this has something to do with power. This has something to do with the image and the air that you're trying to create. Um, this has uh, a lot to do with not making yourself be tangible and touchable for, um, for society, for the users, um, but also uh, for the, on a political level. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think you're touching on some really key uh, points here uh, around the nature of these companies and what they are actually endeavoring to do. Uh, to be sure, um, there is in this ambiguity and this, uh, this lack of transparency that they that they develop, they create a certain mystique, right? That leads to the elevation of of these figures as um, you know, as as uh, sort of traveling the world and influencing policy to the benefit of their companies all, all over the world. Uh, on the one hand, and and on the other hand, uh, so on the one hand, the companies sort of want to take this uh, this this role in the public sphere, uh, acting almost as if. They exist in the in the realm of the public sphere, intimating to us the the users that we ought to regard these platforms as as our local town square where we might go and um, stand on a soapbox and and speak our mind, on the one hand. But on the other hand, they will be the first to uh, to assert their rights as private entities, as 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 corporate entities uh, who are not beholden to the same sorts of things as as an organization in the public good uh, might be when it when it serves their purposes and and ultimately and fundamentally what we've been um, persuaded so often to forget about these firms is that they are in the business of making money they're in the business of of a profit motive they're interested in um, in advertising they're interested in um, 
gaining access to all sorts of behavioral and demographic information. They're interested in enhancing artificial intelligence based on our user input. Um, it's a byproduct that we go there and, and spend leisure time and that we happen to do these sorts of things of our own volition. I, I mean, my God, we're in Germany. We're in Berlin. I, my first time here, I've seen uh, the lives of others. You know what I mean? This would be a fantasy for, for, uh, for state surveillance to ask, uh, ask the populace to come and sort of fill up vessels like this with all of this private information, and yet we do it, and sort of forget that Facebook is a, a company that tr trades, that Google trades at something like $700 a share. Now, when it comes down to it, and there's a free speech motivation that flies in the face of a profit motivation, it's in the nature of this corporate entity to fall down on one side rather than the other, and yet, um, at, in, in society, in, in this moment in society, we seem to be expecting some other result. And, uh, and then we're surprised when we find out that perhaps um, this motivation will outweigh what our expectation is for, uh, for these platforms to serve as some sort of democratic agent. And, and doing so, I should add, in, the, in a continued shrinking public sphere, right? Right. And all this shows to us why we should deal with those young people, even on the Philippines, who become maybe mad or depressive or have uh, some psychological problems after making this wor uh, work. I, I, I would, can I just add something? Because I, I have a question. Um, so I think that, you know, the general sort of um, topic of regarding these workers on the Philippines is not necessarily a digital one. It's a very classic um, Western affluent society, poor developing world um, formula, right? Um, it's, Even it's, this, it's a digital sweatshop, as, yeah. as, as both of you pointed out earlier. And yes, and very much a form of economic uh, colonialism, as you pointed out also, uh, Sarah, in your talk. Um, so in a way, I think just as little as we can expect to go and buy a t-shirt for five euro and have that made under fair conditions, we're using these platforms and only paying with our data, although we all know that is a very high price, is also you know, an expectation that's maybe sort of part of the same, we're living in this, yeah, in this abundance and, and not thinking twice about the people paying for it at the other end. Um, so in a way that, you know, we as consumers, we have a responsibility to consume responsibly and to put those companies under pressure. We've done so to a certain extent with clean clothing campaigns and in other areas, although that is also um, an area that should not be forgotten about other industries. But it's maybe something that we need to pay more attention to in the digital industry. That's one point I wanted to make, but the question I have is, you both pointed out twice this idea that, um, you know, they, they're trying to create this family persona, this idea that we all belong together. And I sort of, maybe this is naive of me, but I kind of doubt that like so is for um, Nike or Ikea furniture manufacturers in some poor countries are also sworn in to like think they're producing and part of one family. Is this because the people we're talking about in this case are higher educated, um, people with a different kind of, I don't know, media exposure? Or why is it that this sort of, we're part of one big global family thing seems to, and this is maybe I'm wrong with this, seems to happen here in this industry and not in any other form of sweatshop that we are used to seeing? Maybe they just want to give them the feeling they are not alone with this kind of work, kind of psychological support. I can, I can only... Uh, talk from my pr perspective, and um, I don't want to claim it's uh, it's a fact or something. But what I noticed, and what really surprised me a lot in the Philippines, was that in these days there are elections uh, in the Philippines. I think in in the middle of May or something, and there is one candidate um, called Duterte, and this candidate is um, has become famous um, and will probably win the election. And what he promises is he cleans up. He cleans up the society. He takes all the rubbish away. He takes all the corruption away. He will clean up. And he will use arms if necessary. And I think maybe it's something we can notice in the world in these days in several places that the risk of, um, of that people might think um, 
If the choice is corruption, a criminal uh, crime, um, drugs, uh, a lot of problems in the world, and on the other hand, a clean world, a world of happiness, a world of um, yeah, where, where, where all these things are taken off, um, they might think they choose this candidate. And I think, um, as we can see on Facebook, this perfectly clean world is obviously quite attractive to a lot of young people. And if this idea of we can build uh, a clean world together and everything what is not clean or what is problematic is just taken out, it's just deleted, we don't have to, um, we don't have to conf confrontate with these problems anymore because we are now in a clean world. Um, if this idea grows, this can become really, really, really risky, I think, because I think it's not a coincidence that we notice that a lot of elections in these days uh, are won by people um, who follow this idea. I, th I think, yeah. <laughs> I think also um, the, the particular nature of uh, these platforms comes into play when you think about the rhetoric that you're uh, that you're identifying as as so unusual and yet so strangely prevalent in in the industry. Um, there's something about uh, the notion of working in in social media and in and in uh, digital cultural industries that um, suggests that that kind of work has more in common perhaps with leisure or play than other types of work. So for workers who, who go to work on an assembly line in a manufacturing context, um, there, there's not a lot to draw upon that suggests that that's a, a, a whole lot of fun. But um, I think that it, the companies that we've seen tonight and, and many other firms uh, in, these, in this sector really Play, play upon and prey upon that aspect of um, suggesting uh, whether or not it's overt or not that uh, working in these industries is a whole lot of fun. And in fact, it may not be quite as fun as, uh, as task us and others might want us to think. Um, I mean, you think that video was scripted? I don't know. It didn't feel quite so genuine to me. So, uh, so somehow this industry has been able to um, suggest uh, both rhetorically and also through other means, putting a climbing wall in the lobby, offering free sushi. Um, you know, I interviewed once at Google and I watched people get their, their, uh, their dry cleaning, getting haircuts and, and free kombucha. Well, what is the effect of this? It's, it's that you'll stay at work longer. Right? It's that you won't leave work. Um, you might want to look at Dave Egger's recent book, The Circle, which is an absolute uh, brilliant send up of, of Google like culture to get a bit of insight into why that rhetoric has cachet in this industry as opposed to others, where, as you point out, it just absolutely would not be able to take hold. Let's open up the discussion at this point because I saw some fingers going up in the air. So here's the microphone. Coming around by Karin Lenski <laughs> from the Böll Stiftung. So here was one, yeah, someone who wanted to say something or to ask. Um, I have, so so th thanks for um, great presentations. I haven't understood something rather fundamental, I think, and it relates to. Uh, Geraldine's first question. So, and the question is, what happens with the stuff that was found inappropriate? Is it just taken down off of Facebook or not made publicly available in the first place with an ex-ante system on, on YouTube? I assume stuff you upload first goes through um, the, um, the the content control system, and then maybe it gets sent to the Philippines and comes back before it. It's like that, right? But the, the actual question is, is there a pipeline to law enforcement? I mean, a lot of the stuff we heard about are crimes. I mean, child abuse is not something that disappears by taking images down, right. but it has. Right. So do we see, yeah. I mean, with masses of images of stuff being flagged by algorithms sent, sent to the Philippines, we see masses of stuff taken down, but do we see masses of criminals going to court? As well. Yeah, good question. Um, so as you can imagine, um, 
the practices themselves internal to these companies vary greatly and, and often because the companies are constructing the systems by which they manage the content internally. So um, there isn't a particular uniformity across these companies. And again, uh, speaking of trade secrets, they treat all of these systems as highly secretive and protective. In the case of the megatech workers who again work, it's a, it's a major platform, they were working with sort of a homebrew series of, of tools built by the company's own engineers to manage this material. Um, they did a couple of things with it. Um, some of the, uh, the, uh, the abuse videos were uh, were repeated frequently so they had a sort of a database where they could match that content to previously seen content they actually did have a pipeline to law enforcement um, it didn't go directly from the ccm workers themselves who again were contractors but they could so-called escalate it through their policy group who then had um, connections with organizations such as uh, the center for missing and exploited children in the united states and what often Often happened in the cases of, of the child sexual abuse content was that uh, sad to say the material was already known to that center and the people who had produced it had been um, caught by law enforcement and identified so uh, certainly they they have triggers and mechanisms within the company to reach out to those kinds of bureaus um, it of course becomes very complicated when you think about the global nature of the production of the content as well so there's quite a bit of saluting technological and otherwise that has to go into determining where things are coming from and how they were produced and then what law enforcement agency would be the right one to engage. Uh, but often a first step would be to go through in the context of a Silicon Valley based firm, um, something like the FBI who could then properly route uh, things. But yes, they did have, um, they did and do have relationships with law enforcement. Although as Geraldine pointed out, um, what we're really seeing is a, 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 a shift in the onus of where these kinds of law enforcement like tasks are taking place as well as uh, decisions made about legality of content uh, and it's being shifted to very low-wage workers who have simply no training in in these arenas whatsoever I mean if they had a law degree they wouldn't be doing CCM right and yet they're finding themselves not only exposed to this material but then worried about what do I do about it uh, and and if they're in a large firm they usually have relationships that they can call upon, um, but uh, you know who knows, frankly. We, we don't know as the general public, and that's not something we're privy to, which goes back to uh, why this is, this is so problematic in, in, in its uh, lack of transparency. Other questions, remarks? Yes, here we go. Hello and good evening. Thank you for the presentation, really interesting. Uh, I have two questions. First, um, we got to know that there are firms in the Philippines, also in Germany and in the US. Uh, what about the other countries, other languages, other firms in the Arab um, region, looking at the pictures? Um, and the second question, um, we are talking about um, the pictures and the videos. Are there also texts sometimes deleted or, yeah, can you talk a little, a little bit of it? about that. Yes, Thanks. thank you. Good questions. Um, I just was re uh, reviewing a, a Filipino um, job site today and I noticed that um, for content moderation the jobs that were being uh, advertised were looking for specialists in Mandarin, Korean, Japanese, Arabic, Spanish, uh, and an Indonesian di dialect, a specific Indonesian dialect. So um, there is absolutely this need for um, uh, s uh, specialists in these kinds of linguistic competencies, but that work still is interestingly located in the Philippines. Although there are firms in uh, Ireland, in Italy, in Romania, uh, pretty much all over the world, scattered all over the world that I've seen in, in my research. And then as to your second point about text-based uh, material and content, um, in fact, uh, there's been 
moderation of text going on on, on the internet since it, it began. I've been online for over 20 years and I used to be um, on text-based uh, systems where we had people adjudicating content. Of course, this was often volunteer-based, uh, but even in the commercial realm, there are workers who look at things like news website comments, for example. That's a big one where uh, this kind of work goes on. One thing about text is that it's a bit easier to automate. It's a bit easier to deal with text um, through a filtering system, for example. But even then, as one of my uh, uh, participants who did do text-based uh, text moderation pointed out to me she said you you have no idea how incredibly creative people can be when they want to write racist comments so you know avoiding those filters is, is it's almost an art form in and of itself where you place an asterisk um, or whatever to kind of avoid so uh, absolutely it goes on with with text comments it goes on in places such as um, newspaper websites um, National Public Radio in the United States uh, has moderation of its uh, radio uh, comments, and and of course there's this trend to shut down comments uh, in many in many. Um in many uh, newspaper sites because it's become too much of a headache and you know no matter what the story is it might be a story about fireman rescues kitten and the first comment is um, Obama's a Muslim kill all the gays you know so the newspaper companies have just shut them down uh, so much for you know free speech right but by the way what happens to all those deleted materials as a matter of fact um, do they disappear or are they storage somewhere else uh, I think it depends, is the answer. Some companies and firms who have the wherewithal uh, technologically keep it. They keep a record of that, um, especially in cases where there might be, um, you know, legal issues to contend with. Um, but some of it, you know, in, in with the Filipino workers I talked to who also worked on a dating site, although I think a different one from yours, uh, there are so many out there that need uh, moderation. Um, you know, they would actually just go into a user's profile and just delete out offensive material, a picture, or the text. And in that sense, it sort of disappeared into the ether, right? Any other question? Yeah, many. So here we go. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, two questions, um, uh, one to Sarah. Um, are there some estimates uh, about the dim dimension of the business worldwide in the US and Europe and the um, Philippines? Or have you looked up the, day, uh, the, the yearly business plan of Facebook, what they write there? And um, the second thing is um, rather to uh, Moritz, you uh, also mentioned that Facebook deletes flags of Kurdistan for uh, Turkish users. Uh, did you have found um, uh, any other examples of yeah, well, kind of political censorship and, and how does this um, collaboration between Facebook and, and uh, the governments start and develop? Uh, just to briefly answer your first question and to go back to uh, the, the vignette you told about uh, your, your attempts to get numbers from Facebook, uh, these companies will not reveal any type of numbers. Uh, on the one hand, um, they disavow a lot of the workers because they are actually employed by other firms, so they can technically say that these people don't work for them. Um, on the other hand, they just are loath to uh, describe the actual numbers because they don't want to indicate how significant a role this work plays in, in the platform. So for those two reasons, they will not uh, acknowledge. I've heard estimates as high as 100,000 from a person inside one of these industries. Um, another way to judge it is simply by looking at the amount of content produced. So when we think about, for example, in the case of YouTube, 100 hours of video per minute uploaded, that gives you a sense of the massive, uh, unending flow of content that um, certainly within that, uh, that amount of content, there's, there's material to be deleted, right? So it's, uh, I would say, certainly uh, only going to grow in terms of need. So anybody need a job out there? I, I know a sector that's hiring. And the second question about the impact of politics and governments and Facebook. I think I think, I think it's worth um, listening to the major policy manager of Facebook uh, saying that they have a zero tolerance against terrorists. That sounds nice, 
but um, she explains what she means by saying this. And this means that it's not only if terrorists post uh, terroristic um, material on Facebook, um, that this is the moment um, they are suspended from Facebook, but that they um, decide if somebody is a, is a terrorist, and if they decide this guy is a terrorist, then they don't accept him on Facebook anymore. Not, not depending on what he posts or not, but just by the fact that he, is a terror he or she is a terrorist. So um, I think this is already um, showing um, the way how these companies deal with um, um, suspicious persons and suspicious material. It's not, um, I, I think this is related to the, maybe to the American um, um, legal, uh, how do you say that, to the... Laws. The laws uh, <laughs> in America. Oh, um, that somebody, if somebody is suspicious, he, needs, he or she needs to prove that he or she is not, um, and not the other way around. And I think it's maybe That's the same. That's not how it works in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understood it like this. Yeah, well. Uh, uh, so maybe this is the way um, how the companies deal with a suspicious material as well. That it's um, it's it's taken off. Um, unless you prove that it's okay to to let it stay on, um, and I talked to um, one of uh, one content moderator who told me about a lot of um, uh, material, video material um, from wars, uh, mainly Syria, um, and they have to delete all this material too. So um, I think um, <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not really sure if they are capable of um, distinguishing between terrorists um, um, or, or other groups or let's say just protesters in Syria, for example, um, the, op the opposition um, and um, in order to, to take them off the internet to, to delete terrorism. I'd like to add two things if I may. So uh, to the second part of that question, um, as far as I know how it works, Facebook has policy officers and they, in different areas, different regions, they engage in dialogue with governments. And so Facebook sets their own rules and then they look at the national context and the rules that country might have. And this applies to a lot of different places, including Germany. So we have our own rules, for instance, on uh, content that's um, right Wing and, for instance, Holocaust denying, and we have a different legislation oh, hate speech here speech as well than, um, than, than many other countries do regarding that content, right? So Facebook needs to abide by those laws, and they take them into consideration here, which is part of the negotiations that this platform has had with our government. And obviously, this is also a point where there is friction, because Facebook's definition of free speech is not the U.S. definition of free speech, and it's certainly not the German definition of free speech. So this is where um, some of these tensions come from. On a, a personal anecdotal note, I know the problems about flagging people's profiles on Facebook and how you're feeding into an evil data machine and probably should be doing that. But also as a person that also spends a lot of time on Facebook, I have um, several groups that I manage with uh, a lot of people in them. And I feel also a responsibility for some of those people in those groups. And it happens very, very regularly, especially like in this high time of sort of ISIS honeypotting, that um, people request entry to the group who ha have been, just as an example, on Facebook for a week, have 3,000 friends, and have entered um, 500 groups within that one week. And then checking their profile, you'd find content, very typical, also has, has gone through the news, of people waving ISIS flags. I brought in um, our speaking friends of mine to verify the content and to like translate to me what they were saying in these videos, basically saying, yeah, this is, this is exactly that kind of page, right? And um, then trying to communicate with Facebook and saying, I would just like to talk to somebody about this. You know, what do I do as an informed Facebook user trying to stop people from uh, like that infiltrating the groups I have? And it's not possible. There is no dialogue and there's no possibility to report this page, especially if you're trying to do it in a way that's not just flag it and enter this discourse. I've tried several times. It's not possible.
I mean, really, what what you're what you're alluding to here is, uh, you know, how how does one speak back to Facebook? How does one speak back to Google uh, when one has an issue? Uh, if we compare that to other kinds of democratic processes, um, th there's really no clear mechanism, right? I mean, I suppose we could all go out and buy shares in these companies and attend the shareholder meetings, although no one in this room would hold enough shares to really warrant any any consideration. But other than that, we're really beholden to the United States of Facebook. Right, and whatever whatever policies uh, will work for them. Now, when it works for them to uh, have a, a, a significant deal of, of, of openness and uh, allow people to post as much as possible, certainly they do. But also, when it behooves these companies to make other decisions if, to enter into certain markets, we know that they do that too. So some companies quite famously capitulate, for example, with China and its uh, so-called Great Firewall and 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 capitulate so that they can be in that marketplace of billions of people. Uh, I don't think I can fault them for that logic. It's, it's a corporate logic that makes sense for them. But where does that leave us when, um, when we want to have you know, interventions onto these companies that kind of leaves us out in the cold, rather? I think there was another question. Wasn't there? No? Please, here we have one. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Um, it was very interesting, it was very disturbing, but it was not more disturbing than the electricity we're using, the food we're eating, the clothes we're wearing, and the gimmicks we're playing with, or gadgets, is the right word. So some of us have learned how to uh, deal with that and turn to other uh, electricity companies, buy other clothes. Um, but most of the people are not schooled to use Facebook, right? Um, what, what are your suggestions? People have to learn how to work with it. It's all not new. It's all been there forever. And it's just too easy to live with it. So uh, this is my question. Thank you. Per perhaps there's an opening for an entrepreneurial sort to develop a more ethical platform for one. Um, certainly, I think uh, what we're calling on this evening is, is uh, unease with the lack of transparency about the realities uh, that undergird these platforms. So there are many people who are quite savvy, as you indicate, and um, people who have had their consciousness raised around other uh, sorts of industries. I think we have yet to achieve that moment wholesale around digital media. There's still, there's still quite a, a, a bit of guild on that lily. There's still quite a, a sense of, of being enamored. And I don't think the critique uh, and the, the power of, of, uh, of consumer pushback on that industry has, has been brought to bear in any kind of way. So certainly, that's one untapped source of, of uh, potential. As people learn about some of these things and become dissatisfied, they can begin to push back. But they can't do it until they're actually informed about um, how, the, uh, how the digital media sausage is made, which is one of the, I think, goals of this intervention tonight, right? Um, well, I'm not sure if that was exactly your question, but I guess this whole point of um consumer user education, but also education of authorities dealing with these issues is always a very, very important point and one of the main solutions that we can offer when talking about this. And uh, maybe this is also something we can relate back to current debates we're having in Germany in regard to what to do against hate speech, which is a very serious thing and, and something that we need to, obviously, looking at the political circumstances at present in Germany and our neighboring countries, something we direly, desperately need to address. Um, however, um, very often an immediate reaction is to call for a stronger uh, criminal law. So changing something in the criminal law that it will make it something, you know, something diffuse, actually. It's very often pinpointed what that should be. And, and I personally think that is a, uh, sometimes problematic, especially um, looking at the importance of free speech in a society and not creating filter bubbles of society when we only hear what we like to hear, which is a very dangerous route that we're going down also. And so, for instance, educating users about their rights to press charges, for instance, um, about things that happen on the net and educating police forces not to take those things not seriously um, 
is perhaps one one thing that we need to be looking at. Before we close this official part of the evening, I would have one final question to you. So who should curate the internet and if so, on what basis? Um, I gotta go. <laughs> um, um, I think we've talked a lot about uh, transparency of Facebook and the role that Facebook has in our society. Um, in no way does Facebook involve its, um, its users, uh, its community to develop its community standards, for instance. There is no such dialogue and that would be something to, interesting to think about. Um, a friend of mine, this has not grown very viral yet, but I'm just going to throw it out there. A friend of mine launched a campaign at the beginning of this year in reaction to Mark's kind um, uh, offer to donate some of his personal riches um, to charitable causes and said instead of donating this billion dollars or whatever it was that um, he was going to share with the world, why not share Facebook with the world and give us all shares? and break down Facebook into shares for its billion users instead and give it to the people. So, I mean, that's of course a very, very utopian um, suggestion, but maybe one that we could add on that list of things to do. Uh, I think that um, your question um, actually, actually goes to a more fundamental one about uh, what place in society we would like these platforms and tools to occupy. Uh, because perhaps the answer about who should moderate Facebook is Facebook employees or their subsidiaries. Maybe that is the answer. But uh, if it is the answer, we need to, as users, know that that's going on, understand the means by which it is happening, perhaps be able to contribute to the, uh, the norms and, and uh, rules that are developed and, and have some recourse, um, as well as, I think, uh, try to really come to terms with the fact that um, whatever these companies are, they're not, they're not uh, uh, public good. There's something else. And I think that ambiguity around the role that they play and the role that they've sort of uh, willingly stepped into and, and really suggested to us that we ought to see them as uh, leads, to, leads to these kinds of conundrums that we're dealing with right now. And if we had a, a better sense about what role they actually ought to hold in, in the social fabric, uh, maybe we wouldn't have such struggles with these questions um, and we would understand uh, Facebook making its own rules on its own island with its own employees and those are the rules of engagement um, enter at your own risk. Moritz, any ideas? I think I'll do it. <laughs> I, I feel my duty. With, with Jesus. <laughs> Moritz for, for president, for Jesus. Yeah. Thank you so much to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Geraldine, Sarah, Moritz, thanks for your attention and your answers I, and I remarks. The Heinrich Böll Stiftung likes to invite you, staying here a bit and um, hanging out with us, having a drink maybe. Thanks for coming and thanks to Christian Römer. And a little, little, little before, yeah, thank you, before the little drinks we have together and I would love if some of you still want to spend some minutes with us. Uh, of course, this is just the first moment of putting this issue forward in this context. And we are going on actually in cooperation, which is wonderful, uh, with Republica on 2nd of May at 12.30. Sarah T. Roberts and Moritz will appear in Republica. And I think as well uh, the Berliner Theater Treffen, where this lecture of Moritz will be performed on the 19th of May as well on the 8th of May, and this is the last promotion we have here, our little festival around the digital stages of extremism, and we'll discuss with theater people and people from the net community on similar issues. So thank you very much for coming in, and maybe you want to join us on one or the other event. Thank you.